Hey, it's Jim, and this is level three of the CFA program, the topic on portfolio management and wealth planning, and part three of risk management for individuals. Let me just quickly remind you that our part one was essentially on human capital. Part two was on life insurance. And now we're going to go ahead and end with a pretty comprehensive problem and then some final thoughts about asset allocation. Here's this comprehensive example that we'll start with. Let me go ahead and, uh, and, and read much of this here. I usually just skim around uh, when looking at the question stem, but let's go ahead and emphasize some things here. Jane and Mark Thompson, they live in Canada, twin daughters. Jane works as a project manager in a large tech firm. Notice that Jane makes 200,000 Canadian dollars a year. Mark is a high school teacher and he makes $75,000 a year. They have some financial goals here. They're saving for their daughter's education and their own retirement. So see how that fits in to the policy statement. And we'll talk about that from an insurance standpoint. Annual living expenses are just 80,000 Canadian dollars. Let me go ahead and pause and say, boy, I wish that uh, my ratio of uh, salary of my wife and me was that much greater than our annual living expenses. All right. Let's see, they both plan to work for 20 more years. What are they? They're, they're both in their mid 40s, right? Relying on their combined income and savings to meet their financial goals. All right, so here's the signal. The signal is, all right, since Jane makes uh, substantially more than Mark, then she's probably in line for more life insurance. All right, we have a new financial advisor, Laura Smith recommends a suitable disability insurance policy for Jane, given her substantial income. All right, we said that. She has a highly specialized job. All right, so currently uh, they insure Jane with a death benefit of 120,000 Canadian dollars. Uh, they're covered by a national health insurance plan. Uh, long-term care insurance, they're eligible for long-term care at a cost equal to 70% of their pension benefits. All right, so this uh, analyst, uh, Smith, is worried about their existing life insurance coverage. That makes sense. She evaluates the family's insurance needs if Jane were to die this year, uses the needs analysis method. So here are a couple of assumptions. Discount rate 4%, tax rate 25 salary and living expenses grow at 2.5% annually. You know, I'm always fascinated when uh, when someone makes an assumption about inflation and just kind of lumps it all. And that's pretty much why the Institute almost has to do it, right? Uh, you can't say, oh, inflation is going to be 2% this year and 7% next year and 14% the following year. That would just throw the mathematics of the problem just completely out of kilter. So it's it's easy just to say, hey, 2.5%. Salary and living expenses occur at the beginning of each year. That's just really a time value of money convention. Nothing really interesting about that. Let's see. Suppose that Jane does pass away. Mark will continue to work. Uh, family living expenses will decrease by 25000 per year. Mark's living expenses will be 45000 per year for 40, 45 years and the daughters will be 12,000. And those are Canadian dollars too, by the way, for, for seven years. So what are those girls? They are, what are they, 17 years old. So I guess by the time they're 25, they will have graduated from a university and have, uh, and have good jobs. Some additional information that's given to us in just a little table. We're told, well, there's the life insurance 120, but now we add the cash and investments of 750, total capital available 870. Uh, cash needs, there's a mortgage balance, uh, there's a fund, there's an emergency fund, so that totals 615. So notice that 870 and 615, they don't equal each other, so that probably has some implications in another couple of slides. Thompsons are considered buying an annuity with the following features. So the, let's pay attention to this. Starts at retirement. So they're 45. They're not retiring till they're, what, mid-60s. They want to have a range of investment options. Remember back in part two, I, I gave you the hint that we'll probably 
hear the word flexibility or some kind of flex word inside of the question stem. Here, invest in a range of investment opportunity, uh, options. So there's another way of saying flexible. A payout continues as long as one of them is living. Okay, Gene has a father. He's also a client, 76, retirement, retired, needs a reliable income stream to manage his present and future expenses. Uh, Davis's parents both live to an old age. He worries about outliving his savings. Smith suggests an annuity. All right, Thompson's also worried about longevity risk due to their family history and healthy lifestyle. So they're expecting to live until they're, you know, 100, 120, whatever it is. Uh, ensure they have the highest possible consistent income stream relative to the cost. They're willing to give up, willing to give up the right to cash out of the policy. All right, so we can calculate any additional amount of life insurance, right? And there will be a difference between the total financial needs and uh, whoops, and the total capital available. So let's go ahead and put together some kind of an estimate of what that life insurance shortfall will be. So cash needs in Canadian dollars, there's that 615,000. And we need to make some calculations here. There's Mark's living expenses. There's the daughter's living expenses. And then there's Mark's income. All right, so that is, uh, those are present values. So let's go ahead and get out our calculators and we'll do that in the next slide or two. So let's go ahead. There are the assumptions, two and a half percent growth, discount rate four. And there's the adjusted discount rate. That's one plus the discount rate divided by one plus the growth rate. Now that's assuming discount rate is greater than the growth rate, which it probably is minus one. Um, Notice that that's essentially just kind of like an F over P minus one, but you have to add one to the, since it's an interest rate to, to take care of the compounding. Um, here's the example that I gave my students years ago. And this is one of the great things that I learned in college. My roommate and I, we would study for a while and he would look over and say, all right, it's time to go down to the arcade. So we would go play Pac-Man. So I want you to think about this adjusted discount rate, right? So you're growing at two and a half percent, but you're taking the present value at four and a half percent. So it's like the Pac-Man machine. Wah -ah -wah -ah. Do you guys ever play Pac-Man? And so that adjusted discount rate is the net effect of the Pac-Man eating this way and the Pac-Man eating that way. That's probably a stupid example, but it's called an adjusted discount rate that is reflective of the difference between four and two and a half. So note that it's not four minus two and a half is one and a half. It's a little bit less because of the effects of compounding. Where else have you, can you learn about Pac-Man in, uh, in the CFA program? All right, so there's a really great formula for the present value of Mark's living expenses. And I know some of you like formulas and some of you like your financial calculator. So if you like the formulas, you can just memorize that. That's, that's pretty much a standard um, uh, time value of money, present value of the annuity due formula. If you don't like that and you wanna get out your calculator, <clears throat> let's go ahead and do this together. Um, set your payments to the begin mode. So do the control begin, however that works. And so what are we going to do here? Make $45,000, make that payment, <clears throat> 1.46, make that the interest rate. Uh, 45 years is N, zero is future value. And what are we solving for? Present value, there you go, 1.498. So either do it that way or, uh, or do it with your financial calculator. Either way is, either way is sufficient. And you do the same thing <clears throat> with the present value of the children's living expenses and the present value of Mark's income. And so there, if you just sum those, you get 595. So let me go back to this. Uh, let me go back to this one here. So look, total capital needs. There's the one, uh, there's 595. And so those total financial needs, there's the 1.2 million. And so total capital available, which we did in a previous, <clears throat> excuse me, a previous table. So the difference between the 1.2 million and the 870, there's our shortfall. So we're gonna say, hey, we need 
$340,073 worth of life insurance. All right, let's continue then on analyzing this extra stuff that we did after life insurance. So we're going to disability insurance, recommend disability insurance due to Jane's substantial income. Comprehensive coverage is sensible. Regular occupational coverage is ideal. Remember, there are a couple of different levels of occupation. You know, I, I, th I think the reading gives the example, suppose that you're a surgeon and you need to use your hands and you're right-handed or left-handed and you, you know, lose the use of your right or left hand. So you, you can't be a brain surgeon or a knee surgeon or a shoulder surgeon, but you could become some other kind of a doctor, you know, whatever that means, just kind of a, a general brain guy or brain girl or um, an orthopedic, whatever it is. So then there's that next level, <coughs> excuse me, and then if you can't even do that next level, then you could go into teaching or something, you know, so that regular occupation is ideal. Life insurance, there's the 340,000 that, uh, that we talked about. Uh, Long-term uh, care, 70% uh, of, of, of the pension. So we're probably gonna recommend that additional policy. And then the annuities, this is one of those things I was telling you about. So the annuity option is suitable probably the, uh, the deferred variable annuity that starts at retirement, which allows for diversified investment. Uh, longevity, we spent some good time talking about the advanced life deferity, deferred annuity, and so this will start sometime later in life, substantial income later in life. <clears throat> All right, let's go ahead and end with a conversation that links us back to the beginning of this reading on human capital. This is a little bit of a review here. <clears throat> human capital, present value of one's future earnings. So what are those risk factors? Of course, the profession, of course, job security, of course, health status, of course, geographic mobility. What are the risks of human capital? Let me just remind you, we talked about this, that it looks an awful lot like a bond because they are steady and predictable returns. If the job is in a salary, of course it depends on the profession and job security, riskier occupations can uh, lead probably to a more conservative financial portfolio. How do we adjust the portfolio to reflect that human capital risk? So, you know, what have we talked about in all three levels here? We've talked about putting together a portfolio based on, you know, interest rate risk and default risk for fixed income securities and systematic risk for equity security. But now we need to throw this extra human capital risk in there. So what do we want to do? We want to combine our investment portfolio with our human capital, and we want to make sure that they link, and we want to make sure that they're related. And so look at those block points there. High-risk human capital should be paired with a safer financial portfolio. What that means is we want fewer equities and more fixed income in there. Stable human capital can afford higher risk allocation. Younger investors, right? riskier financial portfolios, uh, older investors should shift towards bonds. So notice that there are multiple reasons there. Older investors, you know, they're willing to take less risk. They might be able to take less risk, but that is linked directly back to their depleting level of human capital. All right, let's take a look at some math here and relate it to the final kind of an LOS about asset allocation. So back here, I kind of, we hinted that, oh yeah, more equity securities, less equity securities. Now let's go ahead and do some math. Here we have two clients. Emily White is a professional athlete. <clears throat> Robert Johnson is a well-established doctor. They both decided on 60% equity, 40% fixed income for their total wealth. So let's look at Emily White here. Her human capital is 80% stock-like with a value of 1.2 million. Her financial capital is 1.6 million. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the 1.2 and we're gonna add it to the 1.6 and then multiply that by the 60% equity asset allocation. So there's 1.6, right? So that equity allocation, there's that amount 1.6 
And so that equity exposure is going to be the 1.2 times the 0.8, right? There's that human capital is 80% stock like. And that gets us to 96, uh, 0.96 million. So take the difference between those two. So there's 0.72 million uh, equity in her financial capital. So do you see how human capital leads to asset allocation? Now for Johnson, we do the same thing, but notice his human capital is just 20% stock-like. So look at the difference here, 80% and 20%. And his financial capital is 3 million. His human capital is 2.5. Now remember back here, 1.6 and, oh, I'm sorry, 1.2 and 1.6, right? All right, so we do the same kind of math there, and uh, there at the bottom, green, allocate 2.8 million equity to his financial capital. All right, so discuss how asset allocation, right? So here, let's finish up this conversation. Both have 60-40 asset allocation, but their allocation uh, into financial capital is different due to their different uh, um, levels of human capital. So look at the purple statement. I, I, this is probably a good one to memorize. It's important to understand the risk associated with human capital when determining asset allocation in fixed capital. So think about what we've done. You know, all through level one and level two and level three, we've done, we've done all this stuff for asset allocation. Now we're adding this human capital element to it. All right, another quick slide here to end. Look at the middle circle there, addressing human capital risk. What do we need to do? We need to consider insurance coverage. We need to uh, consider education and the investment in skills and knowledge to improve our human capital, diversification of income so sources, and then uh, human capital, of course, in a family can have multiple earners, each with different levels of human capital. So here's just a quick, simple example here, a young professional on the left, an individual who is retired. So, you know, they probably have separate kinds of things. What did we talk about this back in level one? If we look at the difference between a young professional and someone who's retired, they would probably have different willingness to take risk and different ability to take risk, but we need to add the layer of human capital and combine that with their insurance needs, not just life insurance, but all those different kinds of insurance contracts that we talked about back in part two. And then I can't have any conversation here without uh, bringing in uh, standard deviation and Harry Margowitz, of course, uh, systematic risk and unsystematic risk. Of course, the, you know, the professionals typically like to call it idiosyncratic risk. Um, so you know, you know the difference between those two. We've talked about that many, many times. Yeah, so how do we reduce that idiosyncratic risk if, if we can do this through diversification or an insurance policy, whether it's a life insurance policy or a disability insurance policy, we have this asset diversification or we can transfer the risk through insurance. And that takes us through all of the learning outcome statements for this really, really super reading. Uh, I, I had a great time reading, uh, going through this. Um, so this is what I want you to do now. There are, I think there's 23 questions at the end of this reading, three, uh, three vignettes. I think it's eight, eight, and seven. Does that add up to 23? So many of the questions we have addressed inside of these three slide decks. So you ought to be prepared to do this. So go ahead and work your way through this. Give yourself, you know, I don't know how long, probably 45 minutes or so to work through those 23 questions. Hey, thanks for watching. Uh, have a great day and good luck studying.